الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد We left off the last session in discussing the categories of shirk and we mentioned that just like there are categories for tawhid the same categories that occur for tawhid are the same categories that occur for shirk and this was based upon the understood concept that tawhid and shirk were opposites so when something has an opposite they will have some sort of similarities as well right so just like there is are aspects of rububiyyah and uluhiyyah and asma wa sifat in tawhid then likewise there are aspects of rububiyyah, uluhiyyah and asma wa sifat in shirk and we finished discussing shirk in the uluhiyyah of Allah uh, in the rububiyyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and bi ibnillahi ta'ala we shall now start by taking shirk in the uluhiyyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so how does shirk in uluhiyyah actually occur? shirk in uluhiyyah takes place in one of two ways the first way that shirk in uluhiyyah takes place is by worshipping someone completely other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will see that this mostly takes place in the likes of the Buddhist and the Hindu religions where they have created statues and these are the statues that they worship this is the grave sin that they have fallen into and this is their way of falling into shirk in the uluhiyyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they take their acts of worship and worship someone completely other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now the second way is a way which is more common and that is that they perform shirk in uluhiyyah along with someone Allah along with someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what we mean by this is that you will worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly but at the same time you will be worshipping someone else so now you look at the likes of some of the heretics of our times who say that when you want any of your du'as answered you go to the grave of so and so and you say oh Allah I ask you by the right of so and so person in this grave that you fulfill my du'a or another example they'll pray five times a day sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala their salah is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but now that you want a child you'll go to the grave of such and such person and you'll sacrifice a goat over there and this is worshipping along with uh, this is worshipping someone along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the greatest of misconceptions is what actually is ibadah in Islam people think ibadah is just like praying five times a day and fasting and making dua and even though they may know that dua is an act of ibadah still they will direct it to someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yet at the same time these people fail to realize that our sacrifices that we do right in terms of the meat that we ate right the lambs the goats the cows any type of sacrifice that we do is supposed to be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone this is an act of ibadah that is legislated in Islam likewise any oath that we take they're supposed to be by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone I specifically from my personal experience that when we go back you know to our native countries you will find people saying I swear by my mother's head I swear by my father's head these are acts of ibadah that we're only used to use you're only supposed to use the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we can only swear by him so people have become ignorant of what ibadah actually is and this was one of the reasons that I selected this course today that we discuss the issue of uh, the four principles of shirk so that we may become clear of what ibadah is and why it's supposed to be only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what are some of the ways that hinder this and what are the, some of the ways that we actually direct our ibadah to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we're not supposed to be doing so so that was the second way that you commit shirk in uluhiyyah and that was that you may have certain aspects of your ibadah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but at the same time you worship someone along with him as well and the first one was when all of your acts of ibadah are to someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then lastly we get to the shirk and the asma wa sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this takes place in three main ways okay so the first way is that you compare Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the creation and what we mean by this is 
that there are certain characteristics and attributes that the creation has that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not affirmed for himself from them are the likes of sleep and tiredness right these are attributes that are particular and specific to the creation yet if you were to look at the first chapter of the Bible the chapter of Genesis you will see that the Christians and the Jews attribute tiredness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth in six days then on the seventh day Allah rested because he was tired وَأَيَّذًا بِاللَّهِ that how can you attribute tiredness to the one who created you and is all perfect so this is how one of the or this is one of the ways that shirk is committed in the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now the second way is the exact opposite that you take some attributes which are specific to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you attribute them to some of the creation and the examples of this again are many right like the knowledge of the unseen right we mentioned those sects previously the likes of the Shia and the heretical Sufis who claim that their leaders and their Imams have knowledge of the unseen this knowledge of the unseen is an attribute that is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when they attribute this to someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they have fallen into an act of shirk in the asma wa sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and lastly is that they derive the names of the idols through the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now you will see commonly in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a key particular number of idols that the Quraysh used to worship from them were Lat and Uzzah and other than them right now if you look at the origin of these words where does Uzzah come from right obviously a lot of us might not know Arabic but Uzzah is the feminine of Aziz right and Al Aziz is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so they took one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and derived the name of one of their idols so they called their, their idol Al Uzza. and you look, look at the word Lat where did the word Lat come from right it's the feminine of Ilah so they derived another name of their idols from the word Ilah like we know Al Ilah is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so thus they derived one of the names of their idols from the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is the first categorization right now that we completed of shirk and we said that this categorization was that every category that exists for Tawheed exists for shirk as well so we mentioned that Tawheed had Rububiyya, Uluhiyya and Asma wa Sifat and thus shirk has Rububiyya, Uluhiyya and Asma wa Sifat now another categorization of shirk that we commonly hear of is major and minor shirk so now in this categorization we're going to be discussing the definitions of major and minor shirk and what are some of the key differences the Prophet wasallam told us in a explicit hadith that is mentioned in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad that the Prophet wasallam said that the matter which I fear for you the most is minor shirk and that is ar riya so look at the words of the Prophet ﷺ. he said the matter which I fear for you the most is minor shirk and that is ar riya so from this hadith we see that there is a minor form of shirk and a major form of shirk right so what is major shirk and what is minor shirk now if you study the books of Aqeera and of Tawheed you will find various definitions of minor shirk from them are definitions the likes of what Shaykh Ibn Usaymin rahimahullah ta'ala mentions and that is that anything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has called shirk but at the same time doesn't take you outside the fold of Islam so I'll repeat that definition again you might want to write this down it might be on your test you never know that one of the definitions of a shirk al asgar or minor shirk is anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or his messenger have called shirk yet doesn't take you outside the fold of Islam another definition and this was a definition given by a shaykh Salih al shaykh and a shaykh Abdul Razak al Afifi very similar definitions and this is quite a complicated definition 
So it says minor shirk is equating other than Allah with Allah in a matter that is specific to him either by attributing it as a means or by way of accident so now what does that mean? who understood what that meant? <laughs> okay I'll repeat that once more so the definition goes minor shirk is equating other than Allah with Allah in a matter that is specific to him either by attributing it as a means or by way of accident anyone want to give an example? the example you gave is correct swearing by Allah is an excellent example now let's expand upon this swearing by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an example of minor shirk and we'll get to some of the examples of minor shirk later on so now some, the swearing by Allah is something which is khas to him right? it's specific to him we're only allowed swearing by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by no one else but certain times you'll find obviously this is amongst the kuffar that you'll hear them say by golly or by jelf right? obviously they don't know what these terms mean but you'll hear them say it and this accidentally is taking an oath by someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when you say by golly you're actually swearing by someone or something called golly right? so this is an act of minor shirk because this is something which is harsh for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but they're accidentally attributing it to someone else now how does the concept of beautifying one's prayer fall under this the way it falls under this we're like why n- let's just say we're praying salah one day right we're in the masjid we're praying our sunnahs for salat al dhuhr or, or for asr and you know one of the imams from overseas he comes in and he's like you notice wow he just walked in let me beautify my prayer so he thinks I'm a muttaqi or I'm a muhsin that you know I do my good deeds you know mashallah I'm a pious person so let me just beautify it now the way this becomes minor shirk is that you're beautifying your prayer right yet at the same time your prayer is still only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the way this becomes minor shirk is that your intention is still for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're praying your salah not for this imam or shaykh that is coming in but you're doing it still for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but this extra that you're adding on to it that's not from the like the asal of the salah Right? This extra that you're adding to it, the extra khushu', the extra firmness, the extra lowering of your head and whatever, this is, follows, falls under riya because you're beautifying it for the sake of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're not changing your intention, but that extra that you're doing is for someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this becomes an aspect of minor shirk. So, if you again, if you look throughout history, you'll not find a very specific definition. And that's why you see the likes of Ibn al Qayyim and the likes of Al-Hafidh Al-Hakami Rahimahumallahu Ajma'een that they don't give a definition for minor shirk but rather what they do is in their books of Aqidah they'll just give examples of minor shirk and they'll expect you to understand it from there this is just based upon the fact that there is no clear definition for what minor shirk is because if you look at the relationship between beautifying one's prayer and taking an oath for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's not a direct relationship in the ibadah right if you look at those two aspects of ibadah you won't be able to relate them together so there is no common definition but what Shaykh Ibn Usaymin rahimahullah tried to do was give something very general just give like a guideline more than a definition and that guideline was that shirk al asghar or minor shirk is every act that is called shirk which doesn't take one outside the fold of Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best so now what are some of the differences between major shirk and minor shirk the first difference and we'll take about four or five differences bismillah ta'ala is that major shirk expels one from Islam and minor shirk doesn't expel one from Islam so one who performs major shirk is no longer a Muslim yet the one who performs minor shirk is still a Muslim the second key difference is that major shirk 
necessitates a person to be in the hellfire forever. It necessitates a person to be in the hellfire forever. Whereas minor shirk might cause a person to go to the hellfire, but once he is purified and cleansed, then he would come out of the hellfire. So minor shirk is an eter- sorry, major shirk is an eternity in the hellfire, and minor shirk is a small period of time in the hellfire. Major shirk, this is the third one now, the third difference. Major shirk nullifies all of a person's good deeds. Right? Like we mentioned that ayah from Surah Al-Zumar. Who's going to remind me with the ayah? Even just the English translation? Anyone? Yeah, this is the translation. Exactly. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Zumar in ayah number 65, addressing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that if you commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَا يَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلُكْ وَلَا تَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will null void all of your deeds and will make you from the greatest of losers. So major shirk, it nullifies all of a person's good deeds. But minor shirk only nullifies that particular deed itself. So like, let's just say that salah that you're beautifying for the sake of the other person, only that salah will become null and void. Or that oath that you take by other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that also will be null and void as you're taking it for someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So major shirk encompasses the person's whole deen. It nullifies and voids everything. Whereas minor shirk only nullifies one particular deed or aspect of it. Now the fourth key difference is that major shirk makes it permissible for a Muslim to take the life and property of the one who practices it. Meaning that the blood of this person becomes halal. That once a person is Muslim and he performs an act of shirk and he's, you know, it's made understood to him that what he's doing is wrong and he still persists and continues in this, then the qadi or the hakim of that area has the right to legislate the punishment on this person. Meaning that they take his life and his property. Whereas minor shirk, it doesn't do this. That the person still stays within the folds of Islam and you're not allowed to kill him or to take his wealth. Now, lastly, and this is the fifth um, difference. I don't know if you want to call it a difference or not, but this opinion exists. That's why we're mentioning it. And that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive major shirk, but will give, forgive minor shirk. And like I mentioned, there is a difference of opinion in it. If you look at the ayah, in general, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرِكَ بِهِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive that any shirk be performed with him. Right? So the word shirk here is something which is generally general. It's very general. It's not um, specified or restricted with anything. So some of these scholars have stated that this encompasses major and minor shirk, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive it, but rather he has to make an explicit and clear tawbah for this action. Whereas some of these scholars have said that no, this ayah only encompasses major shirk and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will naturally and automatically forgive uh, a shirk al asghar or the minor shirk. Wallahu ta'ala alam. So these are some of the key differences between major and minor shirk. Now, before we change the topics, this is ta'ala, and that was the next topic we're going to be taking is how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam perfected tawheed. I want to take a small quiz. Oh, it's not pertaining to what we took. I'm not going to quiz you on that yet. But my question now is, there is an ayah in the Qur'an, right? We, know, we all know the categories of Tawheed. We mentioned that Tawheed was al rububiyyah al uluhiyyah and al asma wa sifat Right? al rububiyyah the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the actions that He does. al uluhiyyah the actions that we do to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like worship. And then the asma wa sifat the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's an ayah in the Qur'an that encompasses all three categories of Tawheed. This is just for the sake of general benefit. Who's going to give me that ayah? Ah, mashallah, we have a hand up. Fadal. We're looking for an ayah. Okay, now where is the rububiyah in that? Remember, rububiyah is the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So where is the action of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that? Explain. Where is Uluhiya in Ayatul Kursi? (laughs) 
Rububia. We're looking for one particular ayah that has Rububia, Uluhiya, and Asma wa Sifat in it. It's in Surah Al Maryam. So it's a bit harder now. It's not Surah Baqarah and Fatiha anymore. We're going to the middle of the Quran. If you turn to. Well, if I give you the ayah number, it defeats the purpose now. But. Allahu uh, Alam, it doesn't seem like anyone's going to get it. So if anyone gets it in the next three or four seconds, we'll give them a special prize. Does that help? I didn't think so. Taib. So we go to the 65th ayah of Surah Maryam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Rabbu samawati wal ardi wa ma baynahuma fa'buduhu wa stabir li'ibadatih hal ta'lamu lahu samiyya. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the translation of this ayah, Lord of the heavens and the earth and whatever is in between them. So worship him and have patience for his worship. Do you know of any similarity to him? So in this ayah, all three aspects of Tawheed are being covered. At the very beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Rabbu samawati wal ard, the Lord of the heavens and the earth. So the Rububiyah is clear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even mentions the word Rabb, which Rububiyah comes from, right? Then he goes, Fa'abuduhu wastabir li'ibadati. And Uluhiya is the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically mentions ibad over here. He says, worship him because he is a Rabbu samawati wal ard. And then at the end of the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hal ta'lamu lahu samiyya. Do you know of any, you know, similarity to him? Now, who's going to explain the asma wa sifat from this? Anyone want to try? How do we derive one of the principles from asma wa sifat from this ayah? Tawadda lahi. No. Exactly. So one of the principles that we're deriving from this, or one of the principles that the scholars derive from this ayah, is that there is nothing similar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may attribute himself, may attribute himself with the attributes, with the likes of hearing and seeing, like we all have hearing and seeing, that doesn't mean that his attributes are similar to ours. So that there are no similarities between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his creation. So in this very ayah, all three categories of tawheed have been discussed. So that was just a small benefit uh, for everyone, bismillah ta'ala. So now moving on to the final and last section, before we actually get into the book Al-Qawaid Al-Arba, that is, how did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam perfect tawheed? So in this chapter or in this section, we're going to be looking at the various ways that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam perfected and protected the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and in the Quran, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمْ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Today I have perfected your religion for you and completed my favors upon you and chosen for you Islam as a way of life. So we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has completed and perfected Islam. And this happened prior to the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And once this happened, the mission of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was over. So in that time, once something is perfected, you have to preserve its perfection. Islam has a perfect nature and Islam is free from imperfections. But rather it is the Muslims themselves that have the imperfections in them. That's why you hear that when people attribute you know, these terrorist bombings to Islam and all these other evil actions that take place to Islam, that's not just. Because Islam as a religion is something which is perfect as it came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet these actions which are done in the name of Islam and by Muslims, they're done out of ignorance and Islam is free from them. So you can attribute a fault not to the religion but to the ones who follow the religion. So this is the perfect nature of Islam. And now we're going to be looking at ways at how the Prophet ﷺ maintained this perfection and how he protected it. Just before we get into that, we look at the famous hadith 
narrated by Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala anhu in Ibn Majah, the 83rd hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said قَدْ تَرَقْتُكُمْ عَلَى الْبَيْضَاءِ لَيْلُهَا كَنَهَارِهَا لَا يَزِيغُ عَنْهَا بَعْدِ إِلَّا الْحَالِكِ that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said I have left you upon a clear whiteness and a clarity and no one deviates from it after me except that he is destroyed so when Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala who narrated this hadith he said indeed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has spoken the truth that he has left us on a shining pipe, on a shining path whose night is distinct from its day meaning that everything is clear about it and then we look at the statement of Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari radiallahu ta'ala anhu who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away and there was not a single bird that flapped its wings in the skies except that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left us knowledge concerning it now what is the point that I'm trying to get across when mentioning all of these athar and ahadith the point we're trying to get across is that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fulfilled his responsibility from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he perfected the deen and he gave us ways and means to protect the deen of Islam as well and that is in the following of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so just as he w- told us about those birds that flap their wings in the sky and he told us about the knowledge of the Day of Judgment and he gave us knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this very way the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us about the sanctity of Tawheed and how we need to protect it and he told us about the evil of shirk and how we need to stay away from it so this is why right now we're discussing and looking at the various aspects the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used in protecting Tawheed so the first way and we should, we'll be taking about 10 of them the first way that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam protected Tawheed and what we mean by protecting Tawheed is that ways that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prevented shirk even though the origin of the act may have been something which is permissible so the first way the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did this was that he prohibited the masajid of being built upon the graves the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade the building of masajid upon the graves and we see this in the hadith of Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha which is reported in Bukhari and in Muslim that Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha was telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa about the beautiful you know places of worship that she saw in Al-Habasha or in Abyssinia when she was there and she said that you know these places were so beautiful and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he showed a a face of disgust at this and he went on to explain why he was disgusted at this he said those people meaning the people of that land that whenever a pious person died amongst them they would build a place of worship over their graves and carve out images of them such people are the worst of mankind in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we all know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us but rather encourages us to build masajid right we all know this right Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has encouraged us in many a hadith from them he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said man bana lillahi masjidan bana allahu lahu baytan fil jannah that he who builds a masjid for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah will build a house for him in paradise so we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encouraged this act but this act is not you know unrestricted, unrestrictedly to be implemented Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited us from building masajid on the graves and the reason this was was to protect the sanctity of Tawheed that people might start thinking that since there's a grave in this masjid maybe we're actually worshipping the grave and not worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so to prevent this from ever taking place the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa prohibited the building of masajid upon the graves secondly of a similar nature the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade burying the dead inside of the masajid now the, bre- the reasoning behind this is the same that the Prophet ﷺ didn't want a time ever to come where the people would think that the grave is being worshipped instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so thus again he prevented the graves to be built inside the masajid and it's with great sadness that you see this in so many places in the Muslim world 
that they'll have a masjid and inside it they will have a grave you'll see this everywhere in Egypt, in Syria, in Pakistan, in India it's all over the Muslim world and it's sad that they don't know this severe threat that Allah's Messenger وسلم, gave he said that they are the worst people in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allahul Musta'an so that is the second thing that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade the building of graves inside the masajid the third way that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam protected Tawheed was forbidding the worshipping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a place that was specific to the worship of someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so now let me explain this in a better way that let's just say there's a particular place in Toronto right let's just call it um, not even a church but like some cult has a temple okay let's just call it the so and so cult they have a temple and in that temple they sacrifice to one of their statues or to one of their gods now a time for salah comes you're walking by that temple it is impermissible for you to pray your salah there because Allah, uh, Allah's Messenger وسلم, forbade the acts of worship in those places that are particular to the worship of other groups and religions. Now, this is clearly seen in. We're going to save that for question and answers time, bismillahi ta'ala. Okay, so now we see this particularly in a hadith that once a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this hadith is reported in Abu Dawood and it was authenticated by Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah Rahimahullah Ta'ala that once a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said I have undertaken an oath to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala meaning I have sworn to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that I will sacrifice a camel at a place called Bawana now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stayed quiet for that moment and then he raised his head and he said was there something particular about Bawana? Yani, was there any particular reason that you said that you would sacrifice at Bawana? you know were there any uh, polytheistic rituals that took, there, took place there previously? and then the man said no and then once he said no the Prophet wasallam allowed him to sacrifice his camel over there so what we learn from this hadith is that we are not allowed worshipping in those places where other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are worshipped right so that is the third point that we derive that we are the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade worshipping in those places that other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worshipped and again the reasoning behind this is so that there would be no confusion as to who is being worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the other deities so that you wouldn't be confused as being part of a cult or part of an other religion fourthly the fourth way that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam protected the sanctity of Tawheed is that we were forbidden from praying and burying our dead at specific times who can tell me what those times are what are the times that as Muslims we are not allowed to pray in our nawafil prayers that is when the sun is rising is this when the sun is setting and just before the time of Salat al-Zahar when the sun is at its highest so we have the hadith of Uqba ibn Amir radiallahu ta'ala anhu he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited us from praying or burying our dead during three hours of the day while the sun is rising until it reaches above the horizon right then when the sun is at its zenith or at its highest point until it starts to descend and then when the sun is about to set until it clearly sets for these are the times when other than uh, when the other religions had their you know times of worship for in particular the Zoroastrians like obviously the Zoroastrians were the ones who worshipped the fire and the sun so it was during the particular moments of the sun that they would actually worship the sun so thus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited us from worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at these times so that we may be distinct from them fifthly the way that Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa protected the sanctity of Tawheed was that we are prohibited from excessively praising 
our righteous and from them is even the Prophet wasallam that we see in the hadith narrated in Bukhari and in Muslim that the Prophet wasallam said do not excessively praise me like the Christians did to Jesus the son of Mary rather I am the slave of Allah and his messenger so we see from this hadith that one of the ways that Allah's messenger wasallam preserved the sanctity of Tawheed is that he wouldn't allow himself and then even more so the other righteous people to be, pre- to be praised or honored beyond their value or worth obviously we know that all praise and thanks and gratitude is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone so thus we should not put people in a situation or in a stance that is similar to that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when you slowly start praising a person right you may reach a level that would reach a level of praise that is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so thus the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cut it off at its root and he said do not excessively praise me like the Christians praise Isa ibn Maryam but rather I am the slave of Allah and his messenger so thus we see that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us his stance in Islam that he is not to be a rival of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is not a contemporary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nor is he a partner of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but rather he is a slave and messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it's with great sadness that again in the Muslim Ummah we see in our masajid and our homes signs that will say Ya Allah on one side then on the other side it says Ya Muhammad equating the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is something that is particular to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone meaning that an-nida or calling out saying ya yeah, to something is something that's particular to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone it should not be restricted to anyone else and should not be used for anyone else so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed us his stance in Islam when he said that he is the slave and messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone the sixth way the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam preserved the sanctity of Tawheed and again it's of a similar nature is that the Prophet ﷺ prohibited the companions to stand up for him in his presence. The Prophet ﷺ forbade the companions to stand up in his presence. And we see this in the hadith that is reported in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ, he entered upon his companions and as he was about to enter, he saw that some of them were about to stand. So he forced them to sit down. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, You are about to imitate the practices of the Persians and the Romans, for they stand up in the presence of their kings, while their kings sit. Do not do that. Now we see from this hadith that the Prophet ﷺ, even through the act of standing, prohibited the Muslims from doing it in the presence of someone, in either of one of their leaders, or one of their imams, or anything other than, than that that the Prophet wasallam forbade us from standing in their presence that meaning we stand up just for their sake and their sake alone because this type of honor and respect and dignity should only be given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone seventhly the seventh way the Prophet wasallam prohibited or oh sorry preserved the sanctity of Tawheed was that he forbade the making of images and pictures and sculptures now we already mentioned uh, the origin of shirk and we mentioned that the way shirk actually came about was that shaitan deceived the children of Adam salam after ten generations that they should make portraits and sculptures of the righteous people so that they may be remembered and eventually over time the people forgot why these sculptures and portraits were made and they started to worship them so thus in order of preventing that from happening again Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited the making of uh, portraits and sculptures and it's such a severe thing that we see that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called them the worst of creation and sent the worst of the curses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon these people and they will be in such a tough situation on Yawm al-Qiyamah that they will be punished the most severely and it will be said to them that give life to those things which you try to create meaning that you're trying to imitate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by trying to create a sculpture or a portrait then on Yawm al-Qiyamah you will be asked to give it life where you tried to imitate the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the seventh way was that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
forbade the making of portraits and sculptures. Now, an eighth way, and this is a bit more complicated to understand, so we're going to take a bit more time in understanding this, is that in attributing places which are sanctified or sacred or places that are filled with barakah, these type of things can only be done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger. And you'll see in certain parts of the Ummah, they'll say that if you go to such and such valley, you will be blessed by the sand of Abdul Qadir Jilani. Meaning that you take some of his sand, take it to your garden and you'll have a Jannah going in your backyard. Like these type of things take place in the Muslim Ummah. And the concept that we're trying to drive over here is the concept of placing of Barakah. And this is only something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do. Right? So thus we see that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they restricted blessing to certain places alone. So in the hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us do not take a religious journey except to three masajid. Right? In Mecca, Medina and al Baytul al-Maqdis Al-Masjid al-Aqsa. So a religious journey is not to be undertaken except to one of these three places. And the reasoning behind this was so that the Muslims would know that it is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that places barakah in places. And it has nothing to do with the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just because Abdul Qadr al Jilani walked on the sand, it doesn't make it blessed. Or just because, you know, one of the great uh, Sufi saints was riding his boat in this ocean, it doesn't make the water blessed. These type of things can only be done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So thus, such exaltation and such placement of blessings is something that was restricted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And one of the ways the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam restricted shirk and preserved the sanctity of Tawheed is that he told us of those places which were blessed. And he mentioned Medina, Mecca and Al-Bayt al-Maqdis. The ninth way which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam preserved the sanctity of Tawheed was that he prevented the Muslims from imitating the non-believers in those acts that were particular to them. And this would prevent the Muslims from falling into, from falling into sin and into innovation. We see this in the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, reported in a tirmidhi and in others that the Prophet wasallam said, مَنْ تَسَبَّهَا بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ That he who ever assimilates with a people, then he is from them. And this is in those aspects or in regards to those acts which are particular to them. So the act of wearing a cross and the act of wearing that little small black hat that they call a yamaka, these type of things are particular to the Jews and the Christians. So thus a Muslim would be prohibited from doing this as it would be something particular to their religion. And thus the Prophet wasallam differentiated between the Muslim and the non-Muslim, meaning that the Muslim is to dress and act and look a certain way and the non-Muslim is supposed to dress and act and look a certain way. Tenthly, another way that Allah's Messenger وسلم, preserved the sanctity of Tawheed was that He ordered all of the graves to be lowered. As we know when you go to the graveyards over here, you see the graveyards of the Kuffar, you'll see that they have these huge massive tombs with the names written in, praising the person the day he was born, the day he died and a whole bunch of other useless information now in Islam this is not to be done a sign is to be put that yes there is a person buried here but no tombs are supposed to be placed at that area right and this is one of the ways that Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam protected Tawheed that it was through these acts of you know placing tombs and so on and so forth that people started going to these places and worshipping them and doing their acts of ibadah there and started making dua and if you look at history itself in the history of Medina when the Ottomans were in charge of uh, al Medina to Nabawiyah you would see that in al Baqiya, the graveyard where the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum are buried that they actually had they call it mausoleums but it actually looks like a house like someone could actually live inside there like that's how big it was so they had like these huge tombs where you can go inside and you know if you want to put flowers or any other thing else or put any form of sacrifice or whatever you were able to do so so now when 
Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah came they said that he destroyed the graveyards of the Sahaba he's abusing the rights of the Sahaba by taking these mausoleums down he doesn't have the respect and honor that we had for them but in such a situation we ask them where is the respect and honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves when he is the only one that deserves to be honored and dignified in such a manner so in any case the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa preserved and sanctified Tawheed by preventing the tombs of the graves to be established and if they were established he ordered them to be chopped down the eleventh way that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa preserved Tawheed was by pro- prohibiting and forbidding certain statements to be said and from them were like the statements of uh, whatever Allah wills and you will right like a companion came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he said whatever Allah wills and you will so then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said do not say this but rather only say what Allah wills right you're not supposed to say that whatever I will and my mother wills and then whatever Allah wills the willingness or the Messiah is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when you say something it should either be insha'Allah you're saying it something for the future or if something has already taken place then you say masha'Allah that this is what Allah has wished right so this is something that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did to preserve and sanctify Tawheed and we'll end off with those uh, 11 examples obviously there are other examples like the whole seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was in actuality the preservation and the sanctification of the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but these 11 instances are more particular so if you go through the seerah I'm sure you will find many more other examples but uh, you know we have a time frame that we have to live up to so bismillah ta'ala we shall now move on to the text the text that we're studying is called al Kawaid al-Arba you don't have to give it out yet don't so let's look at the title of this book al Kawaid al-Arba what does it mean where does it come from the word Kawaid in Arabic is the plural of the word Qaida I'm sure you've all heard of al Qaida I don't think there's anyone who hasn't heard of it and Qaida in the Arabic language means a foundation or a basis from which you make branches or factors from it right so it's very similar to an asal right we all know asal usul qaida and qawaid are similar in the sense that it is a basis or a foundation from which you build other things on top of it now arba in the arabic language is four so al qawaid al arba are actually four principles and like we mentioned these four principles are pertaining to shirk in which we distinguish ourselves from the mushrikeen not only in our ibadah but in other aspects as well and that is what the topic of this book is so now before dwelling into the book we're actually going to dwell into the book starting from tomorrow bismillahi ta'ala and we're going to end off before Salat al-Maghrib we're just going to take a brief biography of the author of this book the author of this book Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab the leader of the Wahhabi sect as he is called now it's subhanallah al it's sad how many misconceptions there are relating to the shaykh rahimahullah ta'ala and we hope by taking his biography and by taking some principles which we will take at the end we will be, you know begin to appreciate some of the work that the shaykh rahimahullah ta'ala did so firstly his name his name was Abu al-Hussein Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab ibn Sulaiman ibn Ali ibn Musarrif al-Wahidi from the tribe of Tamim is there anyone that's actually writing it down so I should repeat it or just if you get the beginning just remember Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab I mean that's easy inshallah and his kunya was Abu al-Hussein okay so his kunya was Abu al-Hussein and his name was Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab he was born in the city of Uyayna which is in the middle of the Arabian Peninsula which is in current day Saudi Arabia in the year 1115 which is the equivalent of 1704 of the Christian era he came from a family of scholars and learned men his father Abdul Wahab ibn Sulaiman was one of the famous scholars of that locality and was a Qadi of Uyayna and likewise his grandfather 
Sulaiman ibn Ali was also when, well known for his knowledge and he had an uncle as well by the name of Ibrahim ibn Sulaiman who was also well known for his knowledge so you can see that he was raised in a house of knowledge where he was con constantly and persistently surrounded by those people who were guiding him towards that which was correct he memorized the Quran before the age of 10 and after he finished memorizing the Quran he traveled around the Arabian Peninsula looking for scholars to study under now amazingly Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullahu ta'ala is often you know recognized and known as an Arab but you'll see that one of his most famous teachers was actually a scholar from India whose name was Muhammad Hayat al-Sindi rahimahullahu ta'ala he died in the year 1165 and his specialization was hadith so Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah met him in Mecca and studied hadith in, uh, under him and another one of his famous teachers another great scholar of Islam was Abdullah ibn Salim al-Basari rahimahullahu ta'ala so these were some of the main teachers of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullahu ta'ala now who were his main students you will see that the vast majority of his main students actually came from his family so his sons Hussein, Ali, Abdullah, Ibrahim they were his main students and likewise we know that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah he wrote and compiled many books and those books also have many uh, explanations to them so one of the more famous books that he has written and compiled is called Kitab al-Tawheed now this book has many explanations to it the most famous of them are Fath al-Majid and Taysir al-Aziz al-Hamid this book Fath al-Majid was actually written by one of his grandsons by the name of Sulaiman right so Sulaiman um, not Sulaiman Abdurrahman was his name Abdurrahman ibn Hassan his grandson was one of the uh, explainers of this famous book Fath al-Majid which he entitled uh, sorry, it was one of the explanations of Kitab al-Tawheed which is one of the explanations of uh, Kitab al-Tawheed which is called Fath al-Majid so likewise from his other students were Abdul Aziz ibn Muhammad ibn Saud and Hamad ibn Nasir and Abdul Aziz ibn Abdullah now obviously these names might not be too recognizable to us and we might not know them very well but if you study history and the more latter day scholars or like between the 18th and 21st centuries their names will uh, become you know quite recognizable as you study the history that took place during that time so now what was the environment that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah actually lived in the environment that he lived in was an environment that was you know a very strange one he thought someone who was raised upon the Quran and the Sunnah he felt like a stranger in his own land he felt like he was an alien there almost and this was due to the fact that there was a lot of grave worship that was rampant as well as many other innovations that took place one of the key things that used to take place in his time was that they used to attribute you know blessings towards trees meaning that they used to seek barakah from trees by rubbing their clothes upon them and then likewise worship would be taking place at the graves and then people would be making tawaf around them and then they would call upon various saints and dead people so this was the environment that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah worked in so thus you see that obviously it took a great amount of effort and an enormous strife for him to actually try to clear up this, uh, these practices of shirk and innovation so thus we see how history throughout history that Muhammad ibn Wahhab he made alliances and made treaties in hopes of eventually clearing up the land of Arabia from shirk the lands of the Haramain, the likes of Mecca and Medina he wanted to clear them from, from shirk as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sanctified them and they were only supposed to be used for the words, uh, sorry for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so now what were some of the famous books that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah wrote right some of the famous books that he wrote were the likes of Kitab al tawheed which is a book which deals with the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what are those acts of worship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated and regulated to be for him alone 
Then another book is called Al Usul al Salata, which are the three, three fundamental principles in which uh, he discusses the three questions that are going to be asked in the grave like, Who is your Lord? What is your Deen? And who is your Prophet? So in this book, he answers those three questions of what Islam is, who the Prophet وسلم, was, and who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. He discusses, in that. he discusses it in that. Then our book that we're discussing, Al Qawaid Al Arba, which are four principles pertaining to shirk. This is another one of his famous books. Then, fourthly, a famous book called Kashf al Shubuhat. And what this means is the clarification of doubts. And what he did in this book was that those doubts that the Mushrikeen used to come with to justify their shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he refutes their doubts in this book. So this is a more advanced book, yet at the same time I advise every single person to, write, uh, to read and to study this book so that you can know the shirk that took place at his time and how it's actually similar to the very shirk that takes place in our time as well and how it was the same shirk that actually took place at the time of the Prophet wasallam. and then he gives you the reasoning and the logic and the manner in refuting their arguments. Then he has another book called Mukhtasar as sirah which is a summarization of the Sirah of Ibn Hisham that the Sirah that Ibn Hisham wrote about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this is a summary of it then there's Mukhtasir of Fatul Bari as you know Fatul Bari is a great explanation of Sahih al-Bukhari written by Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani right and this book is very extensive and very detailed so what he did was he summarized this book and then Seventhly, we have a book called Mukhtasir Zadul Ma'ad. Zadul Ma'ad, which is a book written by Ibn Al-Qayyim rahimahullah, describing the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from beginning to end, up to the most minute and intricate details. Right? As meticulous as Ibn Al-Qayyim could get, that's how meticulous he actually did get. He described every single detail of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the best of his ability. And this comes out to be about six or seven volumes. So, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah, he summarized it and called it Mukhtasar Zad al Ma'ad. So these are some of the more um, well known or famous books that the Shaykh Rahimahullah Ta'ala wrote. And he lived for quite a long period of time. He died at the age of 91. Right? Who's going to tell me when he was born? When was the Shaykh Rahimahullah born? 1715? Okay. 1704 and 1151 correct? is it? or I might be mistaken or oh, the 15 sorry 1115 is correct not 1151 1115 and that's the equivalent of 1704 now the Sheikh Rahimahullah Ta'ala he died 1206 after the Hijrah so 1115 to 1206 who's going to do the math? <laughs> no, 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 I'm not asking for the conversion of the years. I'm going to ask how old was the Sheikh when he died. That's what I'm asking. He was, the Sheikh was 91, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And that 1206 is the equivalent of 1792. So now, during his time, there were other great scholars that he met uh, that praised him as well. From them were the likes of uh, Al Amir al Sanani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, the author of Subal al Salam. And likewise, Imam al-Shawkani rahimahullah ta'ala the author of Nail al-Awtar and Fatul al-Qadir we mentioned him previously as well so these scholars they met him and they praised him and they praised his works so now comes the important subject before we end off for Salat al-Maghrib and for the day as well is there's a lot of controversy about Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab what is our stance towards him as well as other individuals that controversy revolves around as Muslims, we know that our foundation is based upon two things, the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in perfecting this deen, He told us of all of those things which are good, and of all of those things which are bad. And in those things which are good and which are bad, we can tell by a person's actions. So if a person did those things which are in accordance to the Qur'an and the Sunnah, then he is to be labeled as someone who is good. And of those people who go against the fundamental principles of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, then those are people who are bad. And this is what we see from the statement of Abdullah ibn Umar, 
you will find it in Sharh al-Sunnah of Imam al-Barbahari rahimahullah ta'ala that he said you will never know the truth by its people so you will never know the truth by the people but know the truth and you shall know its people I'll repeat that again he said you will never know the truth by the people but know the truth and you shall know its people so what this means is that in order to know which people are good and which people are bad you have to know what good and bad is first of all so increase yourself in a knowledge of Islam in knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah if you want to know which those good people are because if you go around to various groups and various sects and various religions and you ask them what do you think about this man if you go to a Christian or a Jew and ask them what do you think about Muhammad they'll say oh he was a pedophile he was a man who was insane he was a magician and all those other evil words that the Quraysh accused them of and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is above and beyond such statements likewise if you go to those people who are filled with heresy and with many innovations they will dislike the people of the Sunnah so a simple principle as the people of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah we have to keep in mind is that the only way we will know which people are good and which people are bad is by increasing ourselves in knowledge in the knowledge of what is good and what is bad and then we judge a person upon his actions so those people who have good actions they are good people and likewise those people who have bad actions are bad people and this is how we distinguish between the two with that key principle that Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma established through the readings of the Quran and the Sunnah and with that we end off for today uh, for those brothers and sisters who don't have wudu now is the chance to go make it we're going to be praying Salat al-Maghrib uh, sorry the Adhan is going to be in about 10 minutes bismillah ta'ala so we end off with that and tomorrow we will actually start with the text brother Hashi has the Arabic text and it will be distributed tomorrow bismillah ta'ala wallahu ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala nabiyana muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam subhanak allahumma wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته